Hello everyone, and welcome to the 100 subscriber Bioshock extravaganza. Wow, 100 subscribers? Big thanks to all my subscribers and everyone who takes the time to watch my content. I wouldn't keep making these if no one was watching. So I really couldn't do this without all my subscribers and all the people who randomly stumble upon my silly movie channel. Now, as promised, for my 100 sub celebration, I'll be doing a massive, multi-part breakdown of not only my favorite game, but work of art out of any medium. A piece that tremendously succeeds on thematic, visual, gameplay, and storytelling levels. One that transcends the supposed limitations of gaming. You've already read the title, and I already said it, so you know what it is. Irrational Games 2007 Award-Winning Bioshock. I've already mentioned aspects of Bioshock's greatness in other videos as an example, so just as I'd use God's Not Dead or The Amazing Spider-Man as my go-to movies for an example of an element gone wrong, Bioshock is that gold standard that I can always pull examples of something done well. Good thing I chose this for a special because there are so many ideas done brilliantly to unpack here that it'd be impossible to cover in only one video. This won't be your typical review either. No, I'm going to analyze and overanalyze every single aspect of the game. Most videos about Bioshock usually go like, oh, there was this weird chick Ayn Rand, then call it a day, but not me. I will go to distance. Well, I can't possibly cover everything. Odds are, Pablo Navarro and Alarm Expert 2 won't come up during the videos, but I will cover most of the game. Before I dive in, I should note that this episode is exposition heavy. Of course, I do my best to keep it interesting and spice it up, especially with memes, but I still need to lay the groundwork before I dig into the morals and themes, the meat of the game. And of course, this video will contain spoilers. This is a nearly 11 year old game. You can pick it up for at most $10 and come back once you've played it. Fair warning too, Bioshock is an M game. Like always, I won't show or say anything too grotesque, but it's inevitable that some more mature concepts and somewhat disturbing imagery will come up. And final warning, Bioshock is a video game. You can only get the full experience by playing through the full game on your own. There is no way that me explaining the ins and outs of Bioshock can even come close to the impact that experiencing it for yourself will have. Don't cheat yourself, play this game! So now, what's so amazing about Bioshock? Why is it my favorite video game and artistic work of all time? And what bold statements does it make on big ideas such as religion, family, humanity, achievement, and objectivism? And what makes Bioshock my favorite thing? The year is 1960. You're on a flight across the Atlantic. Then suddenly, they're screaming. The screen goes black, and you're tossed into the ocean amidst the wreckage. You surface only to find a lighthouse just standing there in the middle of the ocean. Without any other option, you swim towards it and walk through a large metal door. It slams behind you. You see a large statue of a man, Andrew Ryan, holding a banner that boasts, no gods, no kings, only man. You step down a flight of stairs, which strangely enough leads to a bathysphere submarine. You step inside, pull the lever, and sink beneath the waves only to be greeted by this statement. I am Andrew Ryan, and I'm here to ask you a question. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow? No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. I rejected those answers. Instead, I chose something different. I chose the impossible. I chose rapture. City where the 
artist would not fear the censor, where the scientist would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well. Rapture is very possibly the most creative setting I've ever seen. The dystopia was founded in 1946, during the aftermath of World War II and the Great Depression era. Rapture was a direct response to these two world events. The most important name to know is Andrew Ryan. On the surface, he was the wealthy owner of his own construction company, Ryan Industries. He lived in the United States during this time, a nation he was proud to be a part of due to its competitive spirit and value of individual achievement and liberty. Then, in 1929, the Great Depression hit, and in 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt became president and began implementing his New Deal policies to relieve Americans of the economic turmoil. Ryan harshly criticized these new policies, concerned that the federal government was becoming too involved in the free market, building a nanny state, and taking powers it shouldn't. During the level of Arcadia, Andrew Ryan personally takes the time out to explain to us over radio message one of his encounters with big government, in which they seized his private forest and moved to publicize it. In a fit of rage, determined not to let an overbearing government take what's rightfully his, Ryan burned the forest to the ground. The final straw, however, was the end of World War II, with the use of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was now clear that the world would consume itself in war and destruction. Also, with the US taking its place as one of the world superpowers, it became apparent that the big government wasn't going away and its competition was the Soviet Union, so Ryan obviously wasn't in love with his options. The only solution in his opinion was to create a safe haven, one free of government restriction, religion, and all means of traditional western morality. Hmm, where have I heard that one before? This city would be a place where mankind can truly excel with the absence of any ceiling. The government would not censor art like it did during World War II to push pro-ally propaganda. Scientific discovery would have no traditional morality around to hinder its progress. People of every background would get to practice their trade without any interference. It would lift people out of the gross and destructive world or rapture them. Yeah, there are a lot of biblical references, which I'll discuss later on. In November of 1946, Andrew Ryan, along with thousands of scientists, artists, engineers, business owners, and artisans, set sail to found Rapture in secret underneath the North Atlantic to prevent a world power from discovering it and trying to control it. As Andrew Ryan puts it, our secrecy is our shield. This is something that annoys me about Infinite. There's no reason for Columbia to float in the sky. It just flies because it can, but everything about that game sucks, so I'll stop mentioning it. Rapture puts on full display that 1940s Art Deco style. The entire city looks like a sliver of 40s New York, with its soaring towers, neon signs, sharp geometry, and polished exterior. Every building and shop looks completely authentic to the time. The 40s culture is also apparent through the music that plays throughout the halls of Rapture. Old singers and groups from the time appear in the soundtrack to really sell the experience, like Django Reinhardt, The Ink Spots, Rosemary Clooney, Bobby Darin, Bing Crosby, and many others. No, no, Bing Crosby, not Bill Cosby. No one's drink was getting spiked in White Christmas. You may also notice the very humanist art inspiration that coincides with the political philosophy of Ryan. What's the first thing you see as you pull the bathysphere lever? The human figure. Besides the giant squid, what's the first thing you see in Rapture? Another human sculpture. Everything about Rapture promotes the worship of man and individualism. Something I love is the uniqueness of each area you visit throughout the city. Each location serves a different purpose and looks completely authentic. It's like the game developers decided to build an actual world first and then plop the rest of the game on top of it. The standout area, in my opinion, is the Strip Mall Fort Frolic. It's riddled with the remains of adult entertainment stores, such as casinos and clubs, again showing the blatant lack of morality. But the mall also serves as a theater and art gallery for the lunatic Sander Cohen, his favorite form of art being plastered dead bodies. This is without a doubt the creepiest level, with his art found all over. Imagine going to the bathroom and seeing this. There's also Apollo Square, 
a war-torn residential area with military checkpoints and hanging bodies. Arcadia is an underwater forest that provides the oxygen and serves as a luxurious hangout spot. Medical Pavilion is pretty much as it sounds, but mixed in with a Hitchcock horror style, complete with a murderous dentist, a morgue, and a plastic surgeon who does whatever he likes to your face. Once you discover the fallen civilization in the beginning of the game, it's clear that something's gone horribly wrong. The first thing you witness is someone get torn to bits by a splicer. What's a splicer, you may be wondering? Well, you obviously haven't played the game, but it's a long story. You see, after the founding of Rapture, everything was hunky-dory for a few years, with the exception of growing class tension, until the discovery of Adam by Bridget Tenenbaum at a wharf in Neptune's Bounty. Adam is a genetic material that's created by a certain species of sea slug that constructs highly malleable stem versions of cells. Tenenbaum describes it as a benign cancer, replacing older cells with unstable stem versions. With tweaking, it allowed the common person to change their genome through gene splicing, hence the term splicer. Anybody was able to splice in order to manipulate their features through gene tonics. You could splice to become stronger, skinnier, smarter, faster, change your hair color, change your race, and even change your sex. It'll keep your face from getting any uglier, just in time. Again, there was no sense of morality to question this kind of experimentation. And remember, changing your sex and race was still widely regarded as a bad thing in 2007. If this game were to come out now, CNN would be having breaking news about how it's sexist and transphobic. Because of its instability and malleability, consuming an abundance of Adam would result in mental and physical deterioration. So, what are referred to as splicers are deformed people, who excessively spliced and lost their minds. You can also see the physical deterioration on their ugly faces. The splicers have cuts, tumors, and blood all over them. Along with gene tonics, which change your attributes, came plasmids. These are different in that they basically grant the user superpowers, such as the ability to hurl lightning with electrobolt, to throw fireballs with incinerate, to move objects with telekinesis, summon a swarm of bees, and so on. The manufacturer of all these atom products was conman Frank Fontaine founder of the company Fontaine Futuristics. Because Tenenbaum was practically a nobody in Rapture, she and her discovery were turned away by all respectable scientific institutions. Out of desperation, she went to Frank Fontaine, owner at the time of the fishery, for funding, causing Fontaine to become the most successful and influential man in Rapture. Because of some of Splicing's nasty side effects, such as seeing glimpses of others' memories in Ghosts, Andrew Ryan was pressured by his counsel to regulate the industry, to which he absolutely refused, believing the market would solve the problem itself. Ryan saw Fontaine's rise as noble, and a perfect example of the opportunity to innovate that Rapture provides. This was until Ryan and his security counsel learned of Fontaine's shady practices such as smuggling. Normally, doing anything to get ahead in Rapture was encouraged, and government restriction seen as immoral, but smuggling objects from the surface ran the risk of exposing Rapture to the outside world and exploitation from the world powers. So ultimately, Ryan and Fontaine became bitter enemies in a gang war. Fontaine and his men versus Ryan's. To get a leg up on Ryan, Fontaine even began pandering to Rapture's lower class citizens by opening a home for the poor in Apollo Square. This is where we see Andrew Ryan start to turn away from his ideology. The threat that Fontaine poses pushes Ryan to enact more and more desperate measures. His first controversy was the institution of the death penalty for smugglers and those who follow his adversary. But knowing that Ryan was closing in on him, Fontaine mysteriously disappeared in a shootout in 1958. Afterwards was another huge compromise to Rapture's original philosophy. Ryan and Rapture's High Council decided to nationalize Fontaine Futuristics, a far reach for someone who burned down his own forest because of America's same actions. Now, some in Ryan's inner circle began to turn further and further away from him, such as his chief architect, Bill McDonough, and chief of security, Sullivan. Even his own mistress, Diane McClintock, began to question him. But without Frank Fontaine, it seemed like everything in Rapture would resort back to normal eventually. Ryan would break up futuristics in due time, and the death penalty will become pointless, so it seemed I. That was 
until 1958's New Year's Eve. In the midst of all the celebration, a wave of bombings and riots begin, along with the rise of a new army of splicers, led by a new, working-class figure, Atlas, who is also the person who guides the player throughout Rapture. Rapture suddenly plunged back into chaos, and an all-out civil war began. With control over Fontaine's business, Ryan started arming his men with newer and deadlier plasmids. As McDonough put it, There's an arms race on here, in Rapture. But it's not about who can build the best guns and the biggest bombs, it's about who can become less of a man and more of a monster. And then he continued by enacting far more policies that spat in the face of libertarianism, like setting a curfew, restricting bathysphere travel, banning public congregations, and silencing those who speak out against him. By this point, Rapture became unrecognizable. Most normal people have spliced themselves silly in order to guarantee their safety from the war and other crazed splicers. Citizens started stocking up on guns and ammo, all the different shops and locations began closing their doors, and only a handful of sane people remained, such as Atlas, Ryan, and Tenenbaum. Many of Ryan's own inner circle have turned on him. Sullivan killed himself out of guilt for enforcing Ryan's policies and his harsh interrogation practices. McDonough was executed after assisting an assassination attempt. His corpse, along with many others, is left on display outside Ryan's office in Hephaestus. Atlas and his bandits still wage a bloody war against the Loyalists until Ryan puts the final nail in the coffin. Lead plasmid scientist Yi Su Chong, before his death, previously suggested to Ryan that they lace the plasmids to make their users vulnerable to mental suggestion, effectively allowing him to manipulate all the splicers. Ryan thinks about the idea and puts it into practice once the war has obliterated Rapture's society. Atlas, losing his army, and without any sane people to turn to, decided to use his ace in the hole. And this is where the events of Bioshock begin. Wow, so that was a lot of backstory, I know, and maybe sitting there listening to me explain it wasn't the most entertaining thing in the world, but Bioshock presents its story in such a way that you're dying to learn more and more. The game itself can almost be classified as a mystery, as you, the player, uncover all the pieces that cause the city to descend into absolute chaos. The storytelling is one of Bioshock's greatest strengths. The key components that you need to actually understand the game are explained to you by Atlas as you traverse what's left of Rapture. Many of the details and character backstories, however, are explained on the side through audio diaries, which is a pretty self-explanatory concept, a diary voiced by the user, and pure visual storytelling. So even smaller roles like Diane McClintock, Electrical Engineers and Hephaestus, and so on feel fully realized. One thing that really helps keep the player immersed is the fact that the gameplay never stops while all this is going on. Atlas may be giving you information or just expressing his feelings to you, but you're still in full control. Same with the audio diaries. You'll pick one up and then you keep going on your merry way. I've played games where you have to stop the gameplay to read a full novel or listen to a boring reader in order to get the full story, and it's really annoying and I never actually want to get the full story because of it. I don't want to have to stop playing the game in order to know everything I should. I've struggled to get through the new Tomb Raiders and Horizon Zero Dawn because these are the exact forms of storytelling they use. In Bioshock, it's very unobtrusive and entertaining to say the least. You want to keep going, you want to learn more. This game has some of the best voice acting I've ever heard, hands down. That coupled with a really intriguing backstory and ideology to explore makes this one of the most unforgettable experiences. Me simply explaining it to you can't possibly do Bioshock nearly as much justice as playing it for yourself. Another aspect that works so well is all the visual storytelling. Every single room in Bioshock has a story to tell, much of which is left up to the player to piece together. It makes Rapture feel lived in, like it was a real, functioning city at one point. We see in Apollo Square, bodies hanging from the gallows. In Olympus Heights, there's a room with a family that committed suicide via poison. We see examples of artist Sander Cohen's madness through all the plastered bodies he has on display in Fort Frolic. In Medical Pavilion, there's a corpse on a dentist chair. A hanging smuggler greets you as you enter Neptune's Bounty. 
There's so much that leaves you guessing as to what happened in this place. And it never feels like you're on an amusement park ride where the game guides you from one exposition dump to the next. Horizon is fresh in my mind, and that's exactly what it does to present you with the big reveal. Needless to say, I was pissed. In Bioshock, however, the world is free and open for you to explore and discover on your own. It never holds your hand like a child, but trusts that you uncover its secrets on your own. Well, that concludes this part of the analysis. Next week will be about the people and characters in Rapture. See you then!